So today we're going to discuss section 15.7. Okay, so we've normally been talking about uh, solutions or salts dissociating into their uh, ions. Now we're going to talk about forming a solid from the solution. So we're going to go the opposite direction. To determine whether or not a solid is going to form, we have to calculate what's called the ion product. This is similar to KSP, except we're going to use initial concentrations instead of equilibrium concentrations. So, for example, let's say we have calcium fluoride as a solid going to calcium ions and fluorine ions. Well, the Q value is going to be the concentrations of the calcium and the fluorine ions initially. If Q is greater than, the, than KSP, that means that precipitation will occur. And if Q is less than the solubility product, that means that there won't be a precipitation. So let's look at an example. So as the solution is prepared by adding 750 milliliters of 4 times 10 to the negative 3 molar cesium nitrate to 300 milliliters of 2 times 10 to the negative second molar of potassium iodate. So we want to know if cesium iodate will precipitate from the solution. Okay, well the first thing that we need to do then is calculate our Q value. So we need initial concentrations of our ions. So the initial concentration of cesium is moles per liter. We know in cesium nitrate that we have 4 times 10 to the negative 3 molar and we had 750 milliliters of that. So 750 milliliters times 4 times 10 to the negative third molar because if it does dissociate we're going to have uh, one part cesium and three parts nitrate. So that will give us our moles and then we need moles per liter. Well, overall, we're combining 750 milliliters with 300 milliliters, so 750 from our first solution and 300 from our second solution. <clears throat> so if um, and our molarity could be milliliter, millimoles per milliliter. So if we divide those out, we should get 2.86 times 10 to the negative third molarity. Let's do the same thing with the iodate. Okay, so now for the iodate, we're starting with 300 milliliters. We need to find the millimoles first. We're going to multiply that by the concentration, which in this case for the cesium iodate was 2 times 10 to the negative second. And it's the same total volume, so 750 milliliters plus 300 milliliters. And if you do the math on that, you should get 5.71 times 10 to the negative third molarity. Now we need to find the Q value. Q is equal to the initial concentrations. If we look at cesium iodate, it's one cesium per compound, but three iodates per compound. So when we do our iodate, we need to cube it. So our cesium is 2.86 times 10 to the negative third times the iodate, which is 5.71 times 10 to the negative third, and we're going to cube that. And so that gives us 5.32 times 10 to the negative 10. Our KSP is 1.9 times 10 to the negative 10. So this means Q is greater than KSP, which means that we will get a precipitate. Okay, so in order to, sometimes we want to calculate equilibrium concentrations of the ions, not just if a precipitate will occur or not. So first thing we need to do is determine if the precipitate will occur. So if we have 100 milliliters of 0.05 molar uh, lead to nitrate and 200 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium iodate, we want to know will uh, lead iodate be a solid? Will it precipitate? So we calculate our initial concentrations of lead and iodate using exactly what we did in the previous example. We calculate our Q value multiplying by the initial concentrations, I being squared because of the 2 here. And that gives us 7.43 times 10 to the negative fifth. It's greater than the KSP, so we know that lead, uh, iodide, lead to iodide will precipitate. Because the KSP is very small, this means the reaction will essentially don't go to completion. So that means that we need to do stoichiometry before we do the equilibrium. So 
The first thing we need to do is the stoichiometry problem. So here are ions going to form our solid before the reaction. We know that we have uh, 100 milliliters of a 0 0.05 molar solution. And so that gives us 5 millimoles of lead. We know for the iodine, we have 200 milliliters of 0.1 molar solution. And so that's going to give us 20 millimoles. And because lead, lead to iodide is solid, we don't, not that we don't care about it, but we don't care about it. Okay, after the reaction, all the lead is going to get used up. And to figure out how much iodine we have left, we need to take the 20 that we started with minus the 5 that's going to react, but times 2 because it's 1 to 2. So that gives us 10 millimoles left after the reaction. All right, the third part is to do the equilibrium. At equilibrium, we know that the lead is not actually at zero. There's going to be a few lead ions left because it'll keep going back and forth. And so we need to calculate that. So we're going to take the solid and look at the ions that it breaks up into or that go together to form the solid. And R, I, C, E. We know that because it's a solid, it's not playing a role in equilibrium. We know from our stoichiometry we have zero lead initially and that our uh, iodine is our 10 millimoles because we need concentrations so we need to divide it by the total volume. We have 200 plus 100 so 300 milliliters and that gives us 3.33 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity. For change solid doesn't influence plus x and this gets a plus 2x because of the 2 here. So for equilibrium we have x and here we have 3.33 times 10 to the negative 2 plus 2x. So now we can write our Ksp is equal to lead times iodine ion squared and so that gives us x times 3.33 times 10 to the negative 2 plus 2x squared. We're going to make our approximations just like we did last time. So this becomes x times 3.33 times 10 to the negative 2. And our Ksp from before is equal to 1.4 times 10 to the negative 8. So if we solve for x, we get that x equals 1.3 times 10 to the negative 5. This means that is equal to the equilibrium concentration of our lead ions and our iodine ion concentration is because of our approximation that we made here is equal to 3.33 times 10 to the negative 2 and this is um, much greater than 2x so our approximation checks. Okay so three steps to solve that problem. Okay, we can also use what's called selective precipitation. This is where we use a reagent whose anion forms a precipitate with only a few of the metal ions in a mixture, and so some will precipitate out and some won't, and so this is selective. Um, it's used to separate mixtures of metal ions in an aqueous solution. So, for example, let's say we have a solution with barium and silver ions, and we add sodium chloride to the solution. Silver will combine with the chlorine and precipitate out as a white solid, but barium chloride is soluble, so the barium ions will remain in the solution and the silver will precipitate out. Okay, so let's look at an example of that. We have a solution that contains 1 times 10 to the negative 4th molar copper and 2 times 10 to the negative 3 molar lead ions. If a source of iodine is added gradually, will lead iodide, and they give you the case P, or copper iodide precipitate first? and then they want us to specify what concentration of iodine will be necessary to begin precipitation of each salt. Okay, so first thing that we want to do is look at, let's look at lead iodide first. So the Ksp for this solid is equal to the lead concentrations times the concentration of the iodine squared. And we know that the Ksp for lead iodide is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 8. And we know that we had 2 times 10 to the negative 3rd molar of lead. 
So 2 times 10 to the negative third times ri minus squared. So if we solve, that gives us an i minus concentration of 2.6 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. So once we exceed this concentration, then lead, lead iodide will precipitate out. Let's look at the copper iodide. We know that the Ksp for this compound is equal to the copper ions. I believe in this case. Okay, and so we know that our Ksp here is 5.3 times 10 to the negative 12th. I don't know what I wrote there. There we go, 12th. Okay, and that equals our copper ion concentration, which was 1 times 10 to the negative 4 times our iodine concentration. And if we solve for the iodine in this case, we get that it equals 5.3 times 10 to the negative 8th. So beyond this concentration, copper iodide will precipitate. And so because the iodine concentration is less for copper iodide, this means that the copper iodide will precipitate out first. And then these would be the concentrations of the iodine necessary. Now let's look at the sulfide ion. Metal sulfides are used a lot because, um, or sulfides are used a lot because their metals differ dramatically in the solubilities. And because sulfide ions are basic, we can control their concentration by regulating the pH. And we talked about this in the previous section. In an acidic solution, the sulfur ion concentration is going to be really small. But in a basic solution, the sulfur ion concentration will be very large. So it won't tend to precipitate as much here because this concentration is so big. So the most insoluble sulfide salts can be precipitated from an acidic solution, leaving more soluble salts in the solution. So if you want to precipitate a really insoluble sulfide, you make your solution acidic. We can also use qualitative analysis to separate ions. And we split these into five groups based on their solubility. Uh, then we can treat them further to separate and identify individual ions. But we'll go through all five groups. Okay, so group one is insoluble chlorides. Only silver, lead, and mercury will precipitate out as insoluble chlorides when we add hydrochloric acid. And so all other metal ions are going to be soluble in hydrochloric acid. So we do this first, and we precipitate out if any of these um, three ions are present, and then everything else is still in solution. Okay, this takes us to the next group, which are sulfides that are insoluble in an acidic solution. The mixture is still acidic because we added hydrochloric acid. And so now we're going to add sulfuric acid. So because we're making it acidic, most insoluble sulfides will precipitate, or the most insoluble ones. So this involves mercury, cadmium, bismuth, copper, and tin. The sulfur concentration is going to be really low due to the high concentration of the H+. So those will precipitate out, and now we can look at sulfides that are insoluble in a basic solution. So now we're going to make the solution basic and add more H2S. The basic solution produces a higher concentration of the sulfur ions, whereas before acidic, our concentration of sulfur ions was very low. And so now our more soluble sulfides will precipitate. This involves cobalt, zinc, manganese, nickel, and iron. Chromium and aluminum will um, also precipitate, but they're going to precipitate as insoluble hydroxides because the solution is basic. Okay, then we move to group four, which are insoluble carbonates. So at this point, all cations have precipitated except those from group 1A and group 2A. Well, group 2A cations are insoluble in carbonate, and so if we add the carbonate ion, we'll precipitate out those group 2A cations, mainly involving barium, calcium, and magnesium. So now all we've got left are the group 1A and the ammonium ion. Well, these form soluble salts with all common anions, so there's really no way to precipitate them out. And so what we can do is do a flame test on the solution, and based on the different colors, color or colors we see, we can determine what ions are present. And so we did this in chemistry. Um, sodium gave a light orange, potassium gives a purple, 
Um, and so we can differentiate that way. Okay, so here are some problems to work on, and we'll discuss this more in class.